Hello everyone and welcome back to Cobian History. Today's video will be a collection of some of my older videos about Rome, which we visited in 2018 I believe. And because at the time I didn't really have many subscribers, I wanted to re-upload this series as a collection video so all of you new subscribers can also have a look at these. You might also have been wondering where I've been this last half a year. And in short, there has been a lot going on. I've had to move house. Uh, I've posted a video about it on my Patreon, about me moving and kind of renovating my new place, in case you want to check that out. But I've settled in now and I should be getting back into uploading more regularly from now on. But with all that out of the way, we'll be getting into the five places from ancient Rome that you can still visit today. I'll give a brief description of these five places here now and the sections of the video corresponding to them should be timestamped as well so you can see where they start and end in the video. Also, if you prefer to watch these in separate videos, a link to the playlist should pop up in the top right of the screen right now. So first we have the Domius Aurea. This was a palace created by Emperor Nero. It was one of the most lavish palaces built in ancient Rome. And after Nero's death, it was buried and a bathhouse was built on top of it. Because it was buried, it was actually quite well preserved and nowadays you can go inside of it and walk through these preserved underground ruins. The second, of course, is the most famous one, the Colosseum. We'll go over the significance of its location, how it was constructed and what it was used for. After that, we take a walk through the Roman Forums and the Palatine Hill, which was at the center of ancient Rome. Then we will visit the Trajan Forum and Trajan Markets, which some archaeologists have interpreted as the world's first shopping mall. And then to end the video, we'll visit Castel de Sant'Angelo, and you might be thinking, isn't that a medieval fortification? Well, yes, it is, but that fortress was actually built on Hadrian's mausoleum, which was the tomb of Emperor Hadrian. But of course, since not much remains of that except for the base, in that section of the video you'll also get a lot of uh, medieval history. So we're starting with the Domus Aria, or Nero's Golden House. The story of this palace starts with the Great Fire of Rome, I'll talk about that in more detail in the section on the Colosseum, but here's just a brief overview of why the palace was built here. There was the Great Fire of Rome, which destroyed a large part of the city, and after that Nero decided to build his lavish palace complex at that location. Where the Colosseum would later be was a large artificial lake. In front of that, to the left in this picture, was the entranceway to the complex with the large colossus of Nero. And to the northeast of that, on the Opian Hill, there was the Domius Aurea building itself. And it's that building that we can still visit today. After Nero died, it was buried by Trajan to make room for Trajan's bathhouse. It's actually because it was buried that we can visit it today and see it in a pristine condition, relatively speaking. So this entrance building, which you can see now, and the entrance hall, which leads to the actual Domius Aurea, was a later construction by Trajan, from when they were in the process of actually burying the palace. So here we have a map of what has been excavated of the palace. The black lines indicate the walls that were there in Nero's time, so the actual palace walls, and the red ones are the walls added by Trajan to give support to the earth that was piled on top of it to bury it. So here is the entrance and we had to go through a hallway made by Trajan to get to the actual palace. When we entered the palace, we ended up around here, and this was actually the edge of a courtyard. You can also see the pillars that would have supported the overhang surrounding the courtyard, and where that wall to the left now stands would be the opening to the courtyard. So along this courtyard, towards the south, there were multiple rooms and at least a few of them had specific color themes. For example, you could have the blue room, or the red room, or the yellow room, which you can kind of see still by the paint that is left there. On the floor, we can also see the remnants of the kind of mortar that was used to keep the marble floor slabs in place. 
These floor slabs, as well as other valuable materials, were removed by Trajan when he buried the building because he could reuse them in other constructions such as the bathhouse he was building on top. This used to be the center of the courtyard, which is now separated by walls, to support the earth on top, otherwise the bathhouse Trajan was building would just have collapsed into the ground. So if we go back through the hallway we just came, to the right of that, there was a room that wanted to create a sort of grotto feeling. At the end over there, there is an opening where water can flow down to give the feeling of a little waterfall inside the cave. Here is a depiction of what is thought to be the fight between David and Goliath. Or it could also be depicting a story from the Iliad where Nestor fights the giant Erythalion, as both these stories are very similar to each other which plays into the grotto theme which tried to emulate the feeling of classical mythology. Throughout the structure there would have been a lot of pools in the middle of rooms and fountains in the hallways and a lot of walls would be decorated with lavish marble and others would be painted. Now the marble walls are of course all long taken out, but the painted walls we can still see. So here are some pictures of the painted walls throughout the structure. Here we can actually see remnants of the bathhouse that was built on top of it. The hole we see here is actually a hole that leads to the water system used to transport water to and from the bathhouse. This was a palace built for entertainment and there's no evidence of doors being used on these rooms and they would face towards the outside. The design of the structure made it so that there were different plays of light at different times of day in all the different rooms. This was a servant's hallway, and you can see even here you have lavish paintings on the walls. As we went further in the structure, we came across this mosaic tile floor. These tiles were left here because it probably wasn't worth the effort of removing all these tiles to use them elsewhere. So they were left here to be buried with the rest of the structure. Now we come to one of the most important rooms in the structure. This is the octagonal room and it is thought that Nero had a contraption built here that when people entered they would be sprayed with perfume and rose petals would fall from the ceiling. This is an early example of Roman concrete, with a dome similar to that of the Pantheon, only smaller. And it also has the oculus in the middle to let the light in. The walls would have been decorated in marble, and they also have a large version of that waterfall which we saw earlier. The water would stream down here and there was a drainage hole at the bottom. We can also see that purple paint was used, which was very expensive and hard to procure. And it was a color that specifically represented the emperor. This purple paint and the extensive gold leaf that was used to decorate the villa really shows that no expense was spared. I should probably also mention the famous rotating dining room that we know from ancient text was part of the Domius Aurea. Now it was actually found in 2009 and it was actually a separate building not part of this main palace within the palace complex but it was on the other side of the palace complex. Only the underground structure remains and nothing of the actual dining room so that's why you can't visit it today. There was a main artist that painted most of the Domius Aurea. His name was Famulus or Fabulus or Amulius, the sources aren't really clear on that. Sources from Roman times claimed that the artist painted a Minerva that always seemed to be looking at you no matter which angle you're looking at it from. The Domius Aurea seems to have been a sort of creative prison for this artist. As we see his work a lot here in this palace and not in a lot of other places. Sometime in the 15th century, an artist went down a hole in the park above and ended up in the Domius Aurea. And over time, more and more people went down these holes, especially artists, to have a look at these paintings. 
So this Roman art inspired a lot of artists from the Renaissance. But back in those days, most of the structure was still filled up with rubble. So when they visited, they were actually standing on top of that rubble and they could only see the ceiling and also touch it. So that's why they also have found a lot of signatures at the top of the walls and the ceilings of these artists that visited here. It was a sort of artistic pilgrimage to come down here and write your name on the wall. However, the discovery of the Domius Aurea and the holes that were dug to go inside of it led to moisture being able to seep through the structure. And thus it also started the decay of the paintings. Here we have an example of a room where moisture got in. While the archaeologists are done with excavating the structure, they are now in the process of restoring and maintaining it. They actually rebuilt the park on top, so it is harder for the moisture to get into the structure. At the foot of the hill from the Domius Aurea is our next location, the Colosseum. The Colosseum is also sometimes known as the Flavian Amphitheater, which is actually its official name. It is named after the Flavian dynasty, the series of rulers who actually oversaw its construction. We'll start by talking about its location. The Colosseum is situated just east of the Roman Forum, which was seen as the center of ancient Rome. The site chosen for the amphitheater is a flat area in a low-lying valley between the Salian, Esquiline and Palatine hills. These were three of the seven main hills which Rome was built upon. By the 2nd century BC, this area had been densely inhabited by the people of Rome. Due to the houses being so close to each other, fires were a real threat. They happened occasionally, but in 64 AD, this area had been completely devastated by the Great Fire of Rome, which lasted six days. Following the devastation, Emperor Nero seized much of this land to add it to his personal domain and built the grandiose Domius Aurea, also known as Nero's Golden House. This was a grand complex which took up the whole valley as well as parts of the three hills surrounding it. The place where the Colosseum now stands was the site of an artificial lake fed by aqueducts and surrounded by pavilions and gardens. A gigantic 30 meter high statue known as the Colossus of Nero was erected nearby the entrance to his domain and it was built to his own likeness. When Nero died the statue was modified to represent the sun god Sol by adding a solar crown to his head. Around the year 127, it was moved by Emperor Hadrian to a spot just outside the Flavian Amphitheater, and it took as many as 24 elephants to accomplish this. And as you've probably already guessed, this is where the nickname Colosseum comes from. The statue is thought to have fallen down or have been destroyed sometime after the 4th century. However, this nickname was only later given to the building in the Middle Ages, the statue itself is mostly forgotten about, but its base still survives to this day, which gives us a clear image of where the statue once stood. After the Great Jewish Revolt of 70 AD was suppressed, Emperor Vespasian funded the construction of the Flavian Amphitheater from his own generals' share of the loot taken from the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. The artificial lake was filled in to make room for the amphitheater and other supporting buildings like gladiator schools were built nearby. This was a popular decision with the people of Rome, not only because it symbolized the reclaiming of the land taken by Nero, in contrast to most other amphitheaters which were built on the outskirts of the city, this new one would stand in the heart of Rome. Part of what remained of the Domius Aurea on the Opian Hill was later buried by Emperor Trajan to make room for his public bathhouse. Construction of the Colosseum began in 72 AD, along with the loot that funded the project, an estimated 100,000 Jews were taken back to Rome after the revolt and were used as a workforce to aid in the construction, such as working in the quarries at Tivoli where the Trevertine stone was quarried and transporting it 20 miles away to Rome. Travertine was one of the main building materials of the amphitheater. 
It was set out without mortar and was held together with iron clamps. Among other materials used were tough and brick-faced concrete. The slaves did not work on the construction itself, or at least not massively. This job was put into the hands of skilled professionals, such as Roman builders, engineers, artists, painters and decorators. When Vespasian died in 79 AD, the building had been completed up to the third story and the construction was finished under the reign of his son Titus in 80 AD, with the inaugural games being held either that same year or the year after. The building was remodeled under Vespasian's younger son Domitian, who succeeded his brother after his death in 81 AD. Domitian constructed the Hypogeum, a series of underground tunnels used to house animals and slaves. He also added a gallery to the top of the Colosseum to increase its seating capacity. Tunnels were also connected to nearby buildings linked to the amphitheatre, such as the Ludus Magnus, which was the largest of the gladiator schools in Rome. It had its own miniature training arena, which in and of itself was a popular attraction for Roman citizens. Other schools were also linked through these tunnels, such as the Dacian and the Gallic schools, where fighters from those regions were trained, as well as a school where fighters of animals were trained, and other buildings like the armory, machinery room, and facilities to treat wounded gladiators, as well as a building where the dead ones were stripped of their armor and disposed of. Now we'll have a closer look at the style of the amphitheater. Unlike the earlier Greek theatres, which were built into hillsides, the Roman amphitheatres were generally freestanding structures. But unlike the common Roman amphitheatre, the Flavian amphitheatre derives its design from that of two Roman theatres placed back to back to each other, which results in an elliptical shape and not a circle. Mast corbels were positioned around the top of the outer wall. They were used to hold up the moss that held the valerium. This was a large retractable curtain used to keep the spectators in the shade and keep them dry when it rained. And due to it sloping down to the center, it caught the wind to provide a breeze to the spectators. Professional sailors were enlisted to operate it, due to it working similar to a ship's sail. The Colosseum's huge crowd capacity made it essential that the venue could be filled or evacuated quickly. The architects adopted a solution very similar to those still being used in modern day stadiums. The amphitheater was ringed by 80 entrances at ground level, 76 of which were used by the ordinary spectators. Each entrance and exit was numbered, as well as each staircase. The northernmost entrance was reserved for the emperor. The other three axial entrances were most likely used by the elites. All four were richly decorated with painted stucco reliefs, of which these are some fragments that survived. In the arches on the second and third floor stood framed statues, probably depicting gods or other figures of classical mythology. The triangular brick wedge at the end of the outer wall is a modern addition, constructed in the early 19th century to support the crumbling walls. The floor of the arena was made up of wood covered by sand, and this is where the word arena is derived from, as the Latin word for sand is herena. Underneath it is the hypogeum, literally meaning underground. It consists of two subterranean levels, where all sorts of props, animals and gladiators were housed before the contest began. 80 vertical shafts provided instant access to the arena through trapdoors, which could be used to lift up animals or scenery pieces. So when the show began, the stage would appear seamlessly with animals, props and scenery pieces such as fake trees being lifted up through these concealed entrances. Now we'll talk about what the Colosseum was used for. Of course there was gladiatorial combat and beast fights as well, but it was used for a lot more than that. Other public spectacles that were held there included animal hunts with great varieties of exotic wild beasts, executions, reenactments of famous battles, and dramas based on classical mythology. And it is said that even for a short time, 
mock sea battles were held here. They would divert the water from aqueducts to the arena and fill it up with water to create an artificial lake to stage them on. But this was no longer possible after the Hypogeum was built. The spectacles were often staged with elaborate sets of moving trees and buildings, and occasionally they were held on a huge scale. Trajan is said to have celebrated his victories in Dacia, with contests involving 11,000 animals and 10,000 gladiators lasting 123 days. During intervals the public was entertained with executions, where the condemned were sent into the arena, naked and unarmed, where they would get mauled by a variety of wild animals. When they ran out of people to execute, they filled the intervals with performances of acrobats and magicians. The amphitheatre was also used to house shows called Munera. These were organised by private individuals rather than the state. They had strong religious elements, but they were also used as demonstrations of power and prestige by a certain family, and they were very popular with the public. Recreations of natural scenes were also held in the arena. Painters, technicians and architects would construct a simulation of a forest with real trees and bushes planted into the arena floor and animals would then be introduced to the scenery. Such scenes might have simply been used to display a natural environment for the urban population or otherwise be used as the backdrop for hunts or dramas depicting episodes of mythology. They were also occasionally used for execution, in which the protagonist of the story, played by the condemned person, could be killed in one of various gruesome but mythologically authentic ways, such as being mauled by wild beasts or being burned to death. Spectators were given tickets in the form of numbered pottery shards, on which there were assigned an entrance, a section and a row to sit on. We can't exactly say how many people would have fit at max capacity, because individual seats were not numbered. They accessed their seats via vomitoria, passageways that opened up into a tier of seats from below or behind. These quickly dispersed people into their correct seats, and upon conclusion of the event, or in the case of an emergency evacuation, these vomitoria permitted the people to exit within only a few minutes. The name vomitoria derives from the Latin word for rapid discharge, and the English word vomit derives from this as well. Special boxes were provided at the north and south end of the amphitheatre, for the Roman Emperor and the Vestal Virgins respectively. These provided the best view of the arena. Flanking them at the same level was a broad platform or podium for the senatorial class, who were allowed to bring their own chairs and the names of some 5th century senators can still be seen engraved in the stonework today, presumably reserving that spot for their use. The tier above the senators was for the non-senatorial noble class or equestrians. The next level up was originally reserved for the ordinary Roman citizens and was divided into two sections. The lower part was for the wealthy citizens, whilst the upper part was for the poorer citizens. Specific sectors were provided for other social groups, for example boys with their tutors, soldiers on leave, foreign dignitaries, scribes, heralds, priests, and so on. Inscriptions in the stone identified areas for reserved for these specific groups. The gallery at the very top was used by the slaves, the common poor, and women. This would have been either standing room only, or would have had very steep wooden benches. Some groups were banned altogether from the amphitheatre, notably gravediggers, actors, and former gladiators. Stone seating, which was later replaced by marble, was provided for the citizens and nobles, who presumably could have brought their own cushions with them. In the rest of the Colosseum, the stone seating was removed for the stone to be used elsewhere in construction. That also caused these hallways, which used to be covered by the seating above, to now be open to the air. You can still see the stairs that would have led to the seating areas. Gladiatorial fights were last mentioned around the year 435, and animal hunts continued at least until the year 523. 
but the arena continued to be used for other contests until sometime in the 6th century. At the end of the century, a small chapel was built into the structure of the amphitheatre, though this did not give the building as a whole any particular religious significance. The arena was then converted into a cemetery. The vaulted spaces in the arcades under the seating were converted into housing and workshops. It stayed like this until the turn of the 13th century when the Frangipani family took over the building and fortified it, using it as a sort of castle. It was in 1349 that an earthquake caused severe damage to the Colosseum, resulting in the collapse of the southern outer wall. Much of the rubble was then reused to build other buildings in Rome. After the earthquake, a religious order moved into the northern part of the building and stayed there until the early 1800s, and a lot of the interior of the Colosseum was also stripped of its stone to be used in other buildings. The marble of the facade was burned to make quicklime, and the metal clamps that held the slabs and the stonework in place were pried and hacked out of the stone to be smelted down and reused. This left the distinct markings on the outer walls of the Colosseum today, and these marks can also be seen in other Roman ruins where a similar stripping took place. During the 16th and 17th centuries, the church sought a productive role for the Colosseum. Pope Sixtus V planned to turn the building into a wool factory to provide employment for Rome's prostitutes, but this plan fell through with the Pope's premature death. In 1671, the church authorized its use for bullfights, but due to public outcry, this idea was also abandoned. In 1749, Pope Benedict XIV endorsed the view that the Colosseum was a sacred site where early Christians had been martyred. He forbade the use of the Colosseum as a quarry and consecrated the building to the Passion of Christ and installed Stations of the Cross, declaring it sanctified by the blood of the Christian martyrs that perished there. However, there is no historical evidence to support Benedict's claims, nor is there even any evidence of anyone before the 16th century suggesting this might have been the case. Either way, even if this wasn't true, it was still a good thing, because it preserved the Colosseum from any further damage. Later popes initiated restoration projects, such as removing the extensive vegetation which had overgrown the structure, and in 1807 and 1827, the brick wedges were constructed to support the outer wall. The interior was also repaired in further decades, and the substructure was also partially excavated by the church. But in the 1930s, it was fully exposed under Benito Mussolini. Today, the Colosseum is one of Rome's most popular tourist attractions and is listed as one of the seven wonders of the world. If you take the Roman road west of the Colosseum, it will lead you to the Roman Forum as well as the Palatine Hill. This part will be a more casual history. We will follow the path I took while filming and I'll talk about the history of the specific places and buildings as we walk past it. So over here we have the Roman road that leads to the Forum from the Colosseum. Over there we can see the Arch of Titus uh, which was built by Emperor Domitian for his older brother Titus to commemorate his victories after he died. One of the victories depicted on the arch is the Siege of Jerusalem of 70 AC. So Titus and the mission belong to the Flavian dynasty and uh, they're most notable for building the Colosseum. So we've passed the arch and we're entering the Forum now. Over there in the distance you can see remnants of what used to be the Emperor's Palace which encompassed the whole hill, the whole Palatine Hill. Um, that white one that you saw over there, that, that wasn't part of the Roman palace. Uh, it was built later by a pope. The pope wanted a nice uh, retreat for himself and he thought, oh, the Palatine Hill, oh, that's a nice spot for it. Um, kind of ruining the ruins. Um, but back then, the, most of the ruins were still underground and there were some stones sticking out, but uh, I don't believe they knew the extent of it. So it can kind of be excused. 
So this is what it used to look like before the excavations. <laughs> also, all along the sides of the forum, there were temples and other buildings. But yeah, the Christians, uh, yeah, pagan temples, they didn't like those. So they uh, converted the temples into churches rather than tearing them down, which is why we can see some preserved facades over there. Uh, but we will get uh, more into that in a moment. So here is a better view of uh, a part of the palace on the Palatine Hill. And to the right over here we can see those temples that were converted into churches. So the entranceway and the pillars are what's left of the Roman temple. Everything behind that is a newer construction as a church. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong, but that purple marble uh, that you see on the pillars, it, it's a very rare type of marble. Uh, and if I remember correctly, it's only found in one place or two places in Italy. And the quarry where it was found has since dried up. They also have uh, some really old bronze doors. So moving on to another temple. Um, again, the columns are what's left of the Roman temple, as well as some stairs, which you'll see later. Uh, but what's behind it is a newer construction of uh, a church, which the temple was converted into yet again. It's a common theme. Yeah, here you have a better view of the giant columns. Um, so you can uh, imagine that church at the back uh, would have been a, a temple. Up at the top you can see the inscription and it's saying it's dedicated to the Emperor Antoninus Pius and his wife. So yeah, here you see some of the stairs that were preserved leading up to the temple, uh, the marble ones. The brick ones were constructed just to fill in the gaps, which there, there were a lot of. So yeah, only a few marble uh, steps remain from the original entranceway. And the dark stone over there is also the original foundation of the temple. And here's a quite interesting little bit. We've got this popular little wall over here with all the people around it. And the reason why it's so popular is because allegedly Caesar's ashes are buried behind that wall. So here we've come to the actual forum part of the Roman Forum. This is what it used to look like, the red dot representing where I'm standing. So over here, that square building is the Curia, so the Senate House, where the Senate would meet and make important decisions. Uh, this specific one is the Curia Julia, which was ordered to be constructed by Julius Caesar shortly before his death. The previous Curias were also built around the same location. Here we have another triumphal arch, this time it's for Septimius Severus and it was raised by his sons Caracalla and Geta. That building we see on the hill over there is the Senatorial Palace. It is a medieval building, but it was built on top of the Tabularium, which was the Roman Records House. We can see at the bottom of it, we still see the ruins of that original building. Here we get another closer look at the palace on the Palatine Hill, well, part of the palace. And uh, we'll go on top of there as well, uh, near the end of the video. There we can see the remains of a basilica, which has its roots as a Roman basilica from around the year 300. And this basilica used to house the Colossus of Constantine. Here we are making our way up to the top of the Palatine Hill. Here we see a laurel tree from which is leaves the laurel wreath is made. So now we are on top of the Palatine Hill. Uh, so this whole area was part of the palace. So emperor after emperor would improve and extend the palace. And eventually the palace got so big that it encompassed the whole hill basically. But spread around were gardens, courtyards and uh, all kinds of buildings. And in many languages, the word for palace derives from Palatine. This might not look like much now, but this used to be a really important room. It was the Emperor's throne room. So in that outcove over there, you can see where the throne would have been. 
also the walls would have been covered in marble slabs like I covered in the Colosseum video. That's why you saw all those holes in the brick walls to hold the marble slabs in place. And this is an example of what the marble slabs might have looked like. So this uh, area over here was where the throne used to be. So at the back of the palace now, um, towards the side of the Circus Maximus. We are on top of the palace now, so uh, we can look down and they had these courtyards throughout the palace. Uh, where the light would come in from the top and they might have had a pool in the middle at the bottom or, or a fountain. Over there on the distance you can uh, even see the Vatican. So you can see there you had a courtyard, you can kind of look into it, all ruins. And over here you had another one. Can look down. Uh, you can see there was a pond there. You can see the outlines. It still has water in it. Um, but yeah, again, all these brick walls they used to be covered with marble, or most of them would be. Where you see those holes in the in the brick walls is where the slabs would have been held. So here, this is a bigger open space. Uh, what you see there is actually what remains of a fountain. And uh, at the back you can see the holes, that the whole wall would have been marble as well. Here we move to the very edge of the palace. There was the throne room. And over here you get a good view of the Circus Maximus. So that's where they would have had the chariot racing. That's what remains of it. Um, the palace also had a connection to it, so the emperor could just go out of his palace and uh, walk straight to the horse racing. Here we have another building and uh, this one, the floor is kind of intact. You can see how it's warped over the ages. So this was part of the Flavian part of the palace. It used to be the banqueting hall and it was lavishly decorated. Here just outside the banqueting hall we had another garden in the middle of which was a pond or fountain with a labyrinth pattern and it had a little island in the middle. Now we're actually on the palace that the Pope built which gives a good view of that uh, basilica we talked about earlier. Now we're moving up a bit and now we're on top of the part of the palace that we saw near the beginning of the episode which gives us a good overview of the Roman Forum. And this would have been part of the palace as well. That's where the Temple of Vesta would have been. And right next to it, uh, this fancy area over here is where the Vestal Virgins had their homes. Over there we can see the Colosseum and the arch where we started. So now we're on the west side. This is behind the area where you can see those uh, arches clearly from the Circus Maximus. This is the Domus Severiana, which was the final extension to the Imperial Palace. So this is the newest of uh, the ruins that we see today. And here as we descend the hill, we can see the remnants of the aqueduct that provided water to the palace. During the Imperial Era of Rome, successive emperors added forums to the Roman Forum. The last of these imperial forums was the Trajan Forum, attached to which are the Trajan Markets, which is our next location. So let's start with uh, what the Trajan Forum is. So you're all familiar with the Roman Forum, a place where the people would meet and kind of the center of Rome. Now after the Roman Republic turned into the Roman Empire, some emperors decided to extend the forums. And that's when we get the Imperial Forums. 
These were a number of forums constructed between 46 BC and 113 AD. The first of these new imperial forums was Caesar's Forum, and the last is Trajan's Forum, which we will have a look at today. Here you can kind of see what it would have looked like and what remains of it. The architect overseeing this construction was Apollodorus of Damascus, and as you might have guessed, the emperor that ordered the construction of it was Emperor Trajan, and he funded the construction of this complex with the spoils of war that he got from his conquest of Dacia. It was built in the valley between the Capitoline Hill and the Quirinal Hill. The form was inaugurated in 112, while Trajan's column, which you can see over there, was erected and then inaugurated the year after, in 113. The main part of the forum was a large open space, and flanking it on either side were these half-round structures. Only this one survives to this day, the other one has been destroyed. And the one that survives are the Trajan markets, which we will have a look at later. On another side of the forum stood the Basilica Ulpia, which is the building you can see depicted here, and that's what remains of it, some pillars. And over here you see also some of the flooring that was inside of the Basilica. Also, uh, it's named Basilica, but it's not the same as the Christian Basilicas we know today, because this one did not have a religious function. It was dedicated to the administration of justice, commerce, and also built to show the presence and the power of the Emperor. Later, however, Emperor Constantine, which was Christian, would base the construction of basilicas on this building right here. And that's how basilicas came to be associated with Christian churches. The Basilica Ulpia composed of a great central nave, with some more side aisles on either side of it, separated by rows of columns. The columns and the walls were made of precious marble, while the roof was covered in gilded bronze styles. Next to the basilica, on either side of the forum, there were also two libraries, one housing Latin documents and the other housing Greek documents. And between these two libraries and behind the basilica stood the 38 meter or 125 foot high Trajan column, which you can see over here, it still stands today. And it commemorates Trajan's victory in the Dacian Wars. The lower half of the column illustrates the first, which took place between the years 101 and 102, and the top half illustrated the second war between 105 and 106. The interior of the column is hollow, and you can enter it by a small doorway at one side of the base. Then a spiral staircase can take you up 185 steps to give you access to the platform above. Built in the column as well, there are 43 window slits, illuminating the inner spiral staircase. Ancient coins that were found indicate that, initially, plans were to put a statue of a bird, probably an eagle, on top of the column. But after it was constructed, a statue of Trajan was put there instead. The statue of Trajan disappeared in the Middle Ages, but on December the 4th, 1587, the top was crowned with a new statue. This new one was not of Trajan, but it was a bronze figure of Saint Peter, and the statue remains there to this day, as you can see. In the mid 9th century, the marble cobble blocks of the plaza were gradually taken away for reuse because of the good quality of marble. But after they were taken, it was replaced with concrete slabs, showing that the plaza was still in use as a public space in that time. In modern times, only a part of the forum remains, because as you can see, a road was built on part of the complex, which was constructed in 1933. Here are some more remnants of Trajan's forum. So I believe these would have been the, the decorations, I think on the top of the pavilions, I think that's what it's called. Like those uh, walkways under the pillars, and you can see nice detail, we got a rose there. Uh, inside we have some bigger artifacts, so those were statues, and they're quite life-size, they're 
like the size of real people, also some uh, nice art there. But yeah, the main thing is that, uh, that I want to point out is that these are like life-size statues, maybe even even bigger, uh, and it it's, shows that it's really about perspective because you can see it was part of this big, uh, elaborate um, pattern on this big building. So if you would have stood on the forum, they would they would have looked tiny, but in reality, standing next to them, you can see they're actually like really big and like the effort that would have gone into decorating all the area around around it here you can see like the whole the whole area everything was was elaborately decorated so now we've come to the trajan market over there the area with the nice styling was actually part of the trajan forum you can see that building over there uh, there was a similar building on the other side of the forum as well but uh, the site we are at now was nestled in the hillside, so the Trajan markets were kind of constructed around it. Here you have uh, a little closer look at that uh, preserved floor from that uh, one part of the forum. Still looks quite nice after like all these years. I, I believe it's restored, so don't think it always looked like that. But here we are down at the bottom. Uh, you get a nice look of the markets over here. You can see there are different levels. And uh, these are the little shops. Uh, I believe they're called the Berna. Those little shops in the Roman times. You can see the walls were nice and uh, painted. It's kind of preserved. A little of the floor there as well. And um, as you might have uh, <laughs> noticed, there are quite a lot of these around here. So some people consider this the oldest shopping mall uh, in the world. But here you got uh, even some more preserved floor. We're on the next level up now. So you can see it's, uh, it's a walkway around there with even more shops. Um, these shops as well, they tended to have an uh, upper loft, uh, a little attic uh, made out of wood. So it's, it's not there anymore. Uh, but that's where they would have stored their, their items and their stock. At the moment, we're at the very top now. Uh, this is uh, kind of a gate, I believe, and there's a, a Roman road um, leading down the back of it as well, which you will go down. You can see those uh, basalt, uh, I believe it is, cobbles, iconic for the Roman roads. So yeah, this is um, behind the main bit where we were before. Uh, you can see there are quite some, uh, some more shops uh, nearby. Over here, these are some lead pipes, I believe, that were also found during the excavation. So they would have uh, transported water, if I remember correctly. You can see some more stalls there. They're all throughout a big, a big shopping center. They even had an inside bit as well, which was over here, and that was the main hall. Now it's used by the museum, so you, I didn't film in there, but uh, here are some pictures. In the Middle Ages, there were some more levels added on top. You can see them over there in like the different colored brick. You can kind of see the transition. So these weren't there during the Roman times. In the Middle Ages, this building was first used as a convent and then afterwards they were used as barracks. So yeah, so here is a better uh, perspective of it. You can see this area was built in the Middle Ages. You can see the different coloring bricks. And then you also have that big tower sticking out at the back, which was also a medieval construction. Now for our last location, we move away from the center of ancient Rome to the outskirts. This is where Hadrian's mausoleum was built. Nowadays we know this location as the Castel Sant'Angelo. This is a pretty famous landmark in Rome and it used to be a papal fortress and after that it became a papal castle. But before it was any of that, it used to be the tomb of the Roman Emperor Hadrian. It was also called Hadrian's Mall back then, or Hadrian's Mausoleum. Here you can see a reconstruction of it. It had statues all around the top, and it even had an artificial garden on top with planted trees. It was constructed between 134 and 139 AD, and this is where Hadrian's ashes were kept, as well as some of his family and future emperors as well, up until Emperor Caracalla. Hadrian also built this bridge that we are on right now that crosses the Tiber River and it faces directly onto where his mausoleum was and now where the castle is. 
The statues we see now were later additions commissioned by the Pope to replace the older pagan statues that were there. Much of the tomb's contents and decorations have been lost since the building's conversion to a military fortress in 401. During the sacking of Rome in 410, urns and ashes were also scattered and the building was looted as well. And allegedly during the besiege of Rome in 537, the bronze and stone statues of the original mausoleum were thrown down onto the attacking force. Legend has it that during the plague of 590, the Archangel Michael appeared on top of the fortress, sheathing his sword as a sign of the end of the plague, and this is thought to be where the castle got its name from. There are also some other legends regarding how it got its name, but I won't go into that in this video. In 1536, a marble statue was created of Saint Michael holding a sword after that legend I talked about, and it was placed on top of the structure. This marble statue was later replaced by a bronze statue of the same subject, which was built in 1753 and you can still see it on top of the castle today. So that was kind of it for the general information. Now we're gonna take uh, a kind of tour and it will switch between the audio of uh, me talking over the footage like I am now. And there will also be some audio from the footage itself from when we were there in Rome. Hello. You look like an old person in this picture. <laughs> My camera's shy. <laughs> yeah, I saw it. I'm a tourist. The little glass has fallen down. Like. <laughs> so here uh, we can actually see where it was the original mausoleum, the darker stone, and where the new accommodations were built on top and the new fortifications. They also added the outer wall and here you can see some features of the castle walls. If you've seen my video on all castle defenses, you might recognize some of the castle features uh, I discussed Caesar, in that video. In Caesarea. Can you read it from there? Yeah, with my camera. I don't have really good eyesight, but it says this: oh. Imp Caesario Hadrianu. Oh, there, yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 got it. So it's a statue of Hadrian. Because that zoom, though. That zoom is thick. That with two C's, thick as a ball of oatmeal. We are on a little turret. I think it's that one. Or, oh no, that one. That's where the catapult was. Oh, you can see the Vatican from here. And the oh, yeah. Like, I can see my house from here. <laughs> Hmm. Are we allowed to go up the little steps? No, it's where there's rope barring off. Oh, I didn't see it. Might be time to up that prescription of <laughs> I was also a little sick during my trip. You might hear it in my voice. Uh, but there was this thing, which I wasn't really sure what, what it was used for. Hmm. I don't know what this is. It's probably either going to be where, like, there might be kitchens or maybe to put things on here to heat them up like say fire hot arrows maybe maybe well at least then if someone fires a hot metal arrow at you it will cut you and then it will uh, also then cauterize, cauterize the it. wound so it's really considerate well it goes how deep does it go how deep how deep is she i can't really see i think it's pretty deep but i can't really see it here you have a better view of uh, well how tall the original mausoleum actually was. Uh, you can see it where that uh, rough dark stone ends. But yeah, we're on the wall at the moment, kind of walking around it. Uh, this was a dry moat. As you can see, it's quite wide. And uh, here in one of the wall towers, you actually have uh, some some cannons on display as well. I believe they're cannons, quite long, long ones. We've made it uh, to the front now of the castle wall. You can see the bridge. And yeah, as my past self said, uh, you get a nice view of the bridge there and the river. 
These are quite nice gardens, like little garden. I think they're a garden. They look nice. Yeah, here you see the arrow holes that I kind of talked about earlier. It's all a good defense. You can uh, see right on the road there, and yeah, some people decided to throw a water bottle in there. This one is more clear, but uh, that one you see in that little garden. Here, machicolations again. Now we're actually inside the central structure of the castle. This hallway was uh, one of the original hallways from the mausoleum. Oh, is this a trapdoor? And yeah, that is a trapdoor. So that was one of the defenses uh, added with, uh, with the castle. Uh, this was the main area to get to the top of it where the residents were. So they were protected and uh, there was a trapdoor there that they could activate when uh, people were storming the castle. As I said earlier, this hallway was part of the mausoleum, so it was originally built by the Romans. We're in the center. So it used to be covered in marble and all that, painted and decorated, but I mean, it was a pretty long time ago, so. <laughs> so the marble, these indents here where there used to be hooks that would keep the marble. Oh, hooks. Because like, it would go in the wall and then the marble would sit on it, kind of thing. Oh. So here we are actually entering the center room of what used to be the mausoleum. So this was the room where we think the ashes were kept, so from Hadrian, his family, and uh, then also the emperors past Hadrian, up until Emperor Caracalla. So now we are on what uh, would have been the top of the mausoleum, but now it's a courtyard as you can see. That statue that you just saw was actually the original statue that used to be on the very top of the castle before it was replaced by the bronze one. So here they have uh, a sort of window, light shaft to let light into that central chamber. So here we have a nice view from the new fortifications that were built on top of the mausoleum. They also had this nice display of uh, pretty unusual weapons. So we got a crossbow, we got a tiny crossbow with like a little dagger attached to it. And uh, it's kind of a crossbow sword, yeah. And uh, we got a miniature crossbow as well. Yeah, these are these were quite interesting. We also see some armor displayed here a dagger that like splits into three I mean like they're pretty cool but I don't think they'll be very practical uh, but yeah there you have another view of that catapult we kind of saw in the beginning the, some tiny cannons as well here they also have some more rooms displaying some more armor and uh, some other artifacts from the castle they also have the chapel over here that was built It's not accessible at the moment. Here you have the uniform of uh, the Swiss Guard, if I remember correctly. Got the long pole there. So now we've gone up a little further and we've reached the Papal Apartments. And these papal apartments are actually what made the castle a castle instead of a fortress. That's a nice scene. Because as you might know, for it to be a castle, it has to be a place of residence as well as fortification. As you can see, it is quite elaborately uh, decorated. This is only the, the entrance hall. I'm guessing this was the lobby. This little room over here is the treasure room. So this is where they would have kept all their treasure. It is quite high up. It's um, in the, well, or basically near the papal apartments as well. You have uh, this narrow staircase going even further up to the top. So we will have a look what, uh, what we can see over there. View of the Vatican there. 
Yeah, it's quite narrow. They had this uh, one-way system, this one-way tour kind of thing that uh, made you go in one way, luckily. So we didn't have any people coming down the stairs. There's a support. There are more rooms, probably just uh, for relaxing. That was the room we were in earlier. They've got a nice, uh, nice um, mural as well on the roof here. I guess the, the, this kind of re resembles an, an indoor garden, I guess. But they have all the windows uh, on all the sides as well, in this room specifically. So we, you would have a, a nice breeze coming through the windows from the one side to the other side. Nice views as well. This is the Passato di Borgo and it is an elevated walkway that connects the Vatican to the castle that we are in right now. It was built in 1277 and is approximately 800 meters long. It was a quick and safe route for the popes to get to the fortress from the Vatican when a threat or besieging army was near. So we've reached the top of the castle now and that's where I will end the video. Thanks for watching, I hope you've enjoyed, if you did please leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more historical content. I'd like to thank my patrons for their support, especially my $25 patrons, G. David and Parker Dye.